connecting into something that really tells a story for us and for you um, and as a way for us to gain critique and feedback from all of you as you take a look at that. So that's most of what, what I'll be presenting. We all... Oh, sorry. We were live on YouTube now. It was the feedback from YouTube. Sorry. Sorry Got about it. that. Okay. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, we've also initiated community engagement activities. So uh, maybe you visited the website. We have some engagement that's directly on the web page for the downtown plan. And I encourage all of you to take a look at it through the city's website. Um, so you'll see some, some ways that uh, you all can leave comments as well as community members can leave comments as well. So that's one way. We're also initiating stakeholder interviews. Um, some of them are going to be individual interviews and some will be group interviews or focus groups. So we're getting those underway as well. And we're looking forward to upcoming community events. So um, Arts in the Park and uh, other events that we're going to be attending and having a booth and gaining uh, input from the community members um, as part of that effort. So the next stage that we're just starting to dig into is stage three, what influences will cause downtown to change. And then we're gonna be looking at the stakeholder interviews I talked about, as well as um, really focusing on market trends. What's happening in this region in the way of downtowns and the kinds of things that would affect your downtown, as well as around the country and the kinds of market trends that are important for us to keep an eye on. So uh, the next update we're expecting to come back to you in uh, July. That will be a more um, solidified synopsis. Again, recap of the analysis that you're going to see preliminary work on this evening, and then also the trends component um, and the results from some of the stakeholder interviews as well, or I should say themes out of those interviews. So uh, we're gonna be looking at analysis and analysis is really about understanding what downtown is today because it is the foundation and the baseline for how we think about recommendations and ideas for the tomorrow of downtown Forest Lake. We think of these uh, components as layers of analysis. Each one really builds upon the others and they become layers in uh, the platform or the foundation upon which we, we launch into design ideas and concept alternatives. So within, uh, within those layers, there are three categories that we've identified and are working on. One is public realm. Um, and within the public realm, it's all those public spaces that are accessible to all. Um, there are green spaces and nature, sidewalks and trails in the community and pedestrian amenities. And then there are private properties, essentially everything that's not public. Um, and there's the real estate, obviously the businesses that are operating within that real estate and the visitor base um, that is visiting and coming into the downtown district. Obviously in your downtown, you also have residential uh, uses that are a really important aspect of private development and private properties. So you're gonna see some information on that as well. And then downtown activation is the third. So those are uh, really only a couple of categories as we're looking at them from an analysis standpoint, and that's attractions, what brings people to downtown and the parking component. So within those layers, the public realm, um, there are a number of the way we've organized this, some kind of key messages or um, things that we think are really important to focus in on. And within the public realm or those shared spaces within downtown, um, these are the things that we've identified as kind of key critical aspects of analysis. Mm -hmm. Connected and cared for public green spaces will pay dividends. Nature, the forest and the lake, in your case, is a community treasure to be accessed and enjoyed by all. A network of social sidewalks is essential. A robust bike network is a major bonus. And finally, pedestrian comfort and security are baseline essentials. So I'm gonna run through some of those components. This first diagram really focuses in on a couple of key things. One is that Memorial Park right uh, at the center of your downtown is within a thousand feet or a five minute walk from all of the district. 
that becomes really critical. I think that aspect of having your primary amenity at the center of what's going on downtown um, is really critical to how we look at the downtown, how you think about the downtown and how others experience this place. Um, I wanna highlight though, the areas that you see in kind of the tan color uh, represent uh, spaces, open spaces surrounding Memorial Park. Um, some of them are parking areas, some of them are street corridors, but what you can notice that I think is really prominent that I want you to look at and pay attention to is that from Highway 61 or Lake Street, there is only really a very narrow corridor, and that's at Broadway, where folks who are traveling through or the community coming into the district have a shot at Memorial Park and at the lake. And that becomes a really critical factor in the way we think about and strategize the future. So I just wanted to highlight that. And you'll see other uh, analysis diagrams that touch on that topic as well. So this next diagram uh, looks at uh, where we have connectivity or gaps in connectivity that become really critical again and how, how people experience the downtown district. So those areas in tan or yellowish are sidewalk gaps. So areas where we have a lack of connectivity from a sidewalk or a pedestrian standpoint through the downtown area. Um, and then I wanna highlight this bike network gap. That's that area that you see in blue because you have this fantastic amenity of the bike trail, the Heartland Trail traveling through, or excuse me, the Hardwood Creek Trail, traveling through the downtown core. But once people try to get off of that trail on their bike, um, there are very few bike amenities or connections from the trail into the district. And that's important in trying to think of that trail corridor as an economic driver, as an experiential component to the way people come into downtown Forest Lake, that becomes really important. So I just wanted to highlight that. The next one, connected and cared for public green spaces will pay dividends. So this is an article of a, a magazine article from a number of years ago that talks about tree canopy within downtown areas and the importance of tree canopy. And uh, we can think of it in the downtown core, which is really more common for us to do as we, you know, we think about street trees on Main Street, um, and that's really important also. But what is also really critical is the, the ribbons of street trees that connect surrounding neighborhoods into the core. Um, because your greatest fodder for getting people deeper and more deeply engaged in downtown town really is from these surrounding neighborhoods, either by bike or by walk, and street trees become a really important critical factor in making those connections. So this diagram identifies kind of in the lighter green again, Memorial Park and the, the central nature of that, and then the darkest green represents where there is tree canopy within the downtown district. And you can see that there, there is good tree canopy around some of the perimeter. But if you squint and look at the diagram, you can see there is a lack of tree canopy in the center. And uh, one of the strategies certainly would be for us to think about how we enhance tree canopy leading from the residential neighborhood districts surrounding downtown deeply into the core. And then also from where people park, which you'll see a diagram of a little bit later in the presentation. But how do we think about the experience of uh, people going from their cars, leaving their cars, going on foot to uh, retail destinations through downtown or Memorial Park. And those connections of tree canopy become a really important factor in the overall comfort and enjoyment of the district. This next one talks uh, about walk score and uh, walking facilities within the downtown district. There are, um, you know, essentially six points or six spots, six street corridors where people can access downtown from the surrounding neighborhoods. And um, that becomes, again, that really important factor in how you're creating this, this connection between surrounding neighborhoods and the downtown. Within the downtown area, the street, or excuse me, the sidewalk network is pretty strong. 
It's really, it's really quite good. And I think what the, the plan, you know, may begin to explore is how there become better gateways and connections uh, into the district and maybe how we expand some of the points of connectivity again between the surroundings and the downtown core. So there are a couple of miles of sidewalks within the, the district, which is again, I think pretty good. You have good amounts of sidewalks in some of the uh, cases of newer development on both sides of that development, both the front and what might be considered the back edge. Um, so that's an important component. Along with whether or not sidewalks exist, this notion of social sidewalks is something that we're probably, you're probably gonna hear more of from me. It becomes um, a really important feature in the way people use pedestrian infrastructure uh, in order to create a more social atmosphere. Um, in the sidewalk connections, again, between neighborhoods and into the district, that five foot minimum is really a critical factor because when people have to walk alone, um, especially if they're with someone else, if they have to walk kind of one in front of the other because the sidewalk is too narrow to walk two abreast, it really has an impact on the way people perceive the space. So uh, having a five foot sidewalk, again, as a baseline minimum becomes a really critical factor in the way we think about the infrastructure for pedestrians. Obviously, Main Street uh, is going to have broader sidewalks, but you have so many instances where there are double-sided buildings, so to speak, that uh, the back edges of those buildings become really critical from that standpoint as well. So about 95% of your sidewalks uh, meet the minimum width, that five foot minimum width. Um, you have some ADA compliance issues. You can see the slide on the lower right uh, where there's a sidewalk that just leads to a curb. There are a few small issues like that. For the most part, your sidewalk network is in fairly good shape. Um, but there are some really critical gaps. So as we get into concepts, we'll be looking at uh, where we have gaps in sidewalks and walking infrastructure and the experience of place um, all layered together. Um, and tree canopy, sidewalks, ground layer, green, green ground cover, all makes a big difference in the way people experience it. So I think uh, this is, uh, and this gets more to some of those gaps in areas also, but it's a good diagram because it, it does illustrate where uh, we have some of those gaps in the sidewalk uh, network that we'll be focusing in on. So these two really go together, this one and this one in looking at where the gaps are. The next one, a robust bike network is a major bonus. The fact that you have a regional trail traveling through your downtown obviously is huge. You all know that. Um, it is a, a major bonus, a, a, a large bonus for you and something that we really think can be leveraged through this planning process. So obviously this diagram uh, suggests that about a little less than $800 million in economic activity comes to Minnesota because of its bike infrastructure and its recreational biking. So uh, stronger ways of leveraging the facility you have traveling through the community is really a, a key factor in, in some of the things we'll be looking at. Uh, there are really three points of entry into the downtown district from uh, the bike infrastructure that you do have. Two of those are the regional trail and one of those is Broadway. And I think we'll be exploring possibilities for expanding the number and the character and quality of those entryways um, as a, a component of what we'll be looking at with concepts. This illustrates some of the, the crossings um, and it gets to, or it speaks to the, the comfort and the, the perceptions of safety that people have in using both the trails as well as, as folks in their vehicles who are crossing the trails. So you can see if a few unmarked crossings in this area of the regional trail um, 
and where Broadway comes in again. So this is, I think, a really important one also. Again, this illustrates in that, that reddish or pink tone uh, areas where there just is no bike network or bike facilities coming into the downtown area. So making that trail work for Forest Lake means that we need to think, I think, really strategically and smartly about how to expand bike facilities and bike access from the regional trail into the downtown core. And not only kind of inform people who are on the trail about how to make their way from the trail into downtown, but provide those facilities that are essential to getting bikers into the community. Um, this one gets at uh, lighting within the downtown area. And the only thing I want to highlight here is you can see the, the, the dots, the yellowish or tan dots represent uh, pedestrian lights or light fixtures in the downtown area. And again, if you squint, sometimes it's easiest to squint at these images, but you can see that there is a, a um, more dense pattern of lights east of Highway 61 or Lake Street and a less dense pattern of lighting to the west. And I think that becomes really important in looking at parking strategies because there may be uh, strategies that are put in place that put more, for instance, uh, employee parking west of Highway 61 or suggest how to develop that uh, in exchange for more intensity of customer parking east of 61 as an example. So lighting becomes um, a real strong asset or component of that. This looks at points where we're lacking some of the pedestrian crossings. Um, the, the red dots are unmarked crossings. And I think when we did our walk a number of weeks ago, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, crossing Lake Street is really an issue. The roundabout uh, is probably not as friendly as it needs to be or should be. So we're gonna be looking at strategies for enhancing pedestrian crossings uh, at that primary intersection of Broadway and Lake and how we create much stronger pedestrian crossings of Lake Street and in some cases um, ancillary streets or crossing streets as well. So you can uh, look forward to that. Next layer is private properties. So real estate should be a good investment I think that goes without saying, but sometimes that uh, doesn't happen in downtown districts. So we want to be looking at the real estate and making sure that it truly is a good investment and uh, doing what is necessary to make it one. The business di district should attract people, buildings should contribute, and links to surrounding neighborhoods support business and generate continual activity. So those are the four key topics that um, we see as important to highlight as part of the analysis with private properties. I want to mention one thing with that last bullet point, links to surrounding neighborhoods. What we've discovered and found working with other communities is that when there's a focus in initial stages of uplifting a downtown district, when there's a focus on making the linkage and the connections to the immediately surrounding neighborhoods, it creates, um, number one, the most logical connection of constituency to the downtown core, but it also creates a buzz um, around folks who view downtown as their downtown, and they establish greater and greater pride in it. They talk to others about the fantastic nature of downtown Forest Lake. And it's something that really spreads in a, in a um, grassroots way. And so links to surrounding neighborhoods is a step one in creating stronger ties to the surrounding communities and the region. So, so that's kind of the way we view this tiered approach or staged approach to thinking about uplifting downtown and those strong connections and the importance of them. So land value. This is uh, identifying 
overall land value um, and the takeaway points are small parcels. And I wanna touch on this condoization of parcels because I think that's really important. And it's something that is helpful in our view to downtown because it's a pathway to ownership of the downtown core uh, for uh, business owners or folks who are interested in investing in a smaller component of downtown. So those, many of those areas you see in red are actually condoized properties. Um, and that is a pathway into ownership of the downtown. And that's important, it's a good thing. Um, however, it can make redevelopment more challenging because of multiple, ac multiple acquisitions. And you can say that about both condoization of properties as well as small parcels. There are a lot of small parcels in downtown Forest Lake. And that I'm sure is, has been and will continue to be a challenge to some redevelopment efforts. This next one is building value. Um, and again, those kind of same, uh, that same issue or topic applies to the, the benefits of condo or condoized properties in the downtown area. Um, I'll mention one other thing also, and that's that the assessed value for buildings along 61 are reasonable uh, for redevelopment. In other words, they, they are probably at a price point that's low enough to encourage redevelopment. Um, but that probably also means that there hasn't been a lot of recent um, investment and reinvestment in those properties, some of them. So that speaks, I think, to uh, people's willingness and interest in investing in those properties the way they are. They may be waiting for redevelopment. Um, the, the rents may not um, establish a baseline to allow for reinvestment. We're not sure exactly why, uh, but there's something uh, to be telling us in that, in that um, issue, in that topic. So this is a diagram of vacant parcels or parcels that don't have buildings uh, on them. Um, most vacant parcels east of 60, 61 are public or public space, the park included, or parking or uh, association lands. Um, they're more likely to be uh, redevelopment possibilities in the future. <coughs> and I just wanna highlight the, the quadrant uh, to the southwest of the roundabout as something that I think needs to be a focus of this downtown plan. Uh, obviously it's vacant and it has some real access issues, but it's something that is an important uh, high visibility site for the community. So this one is about building frontage and the types of uses that are within those buildings. If we extrapolate the use as kind of the depth of the building and pull it right to the front, this becomes a really important topic in the way people and customers experience downtown. So if you focus in on this diagram of the red frontages, um, those are the retail frontages. And those are the, the, the uses within those frontage types that are going to potentially draw folks to stroll through the downtown. People who are experiencing a downtown really like loops. They want to be able to experience storefronts in a loop pattern. Doesn't always happen. If you think of downtown Stillwater, there's very little looping. It's all to one side of the street. So it's not a hard and fast rule, but in general, communities that have a loop opportunity for strollers or shoppers um, experience a, a more robust opportunity um, kind of as a whole within the district. And again, if you squint and take a look at this map, the area between uh, in the block between Broadway and to the north, there's fairly strong uh, retail frontage in that area on the east side. Only a couple of opportunities or retail frontages on the west side. So folks who might be inclined to go to a shop on the east side are probably not inclined to walk past other storefronts to get to, the, to those on the west side. And that uh, is something that 
we can look at from a, a building frontage or a building type or redevelopment standpoint, um, as well as a facilities and a streetscape character and design aspect as we look at the plan. If downtown Forest Lake uh, is more than a one block experience, uh, the area to the south would be the most likely possibility, but there's very little retail frontage in that block to the south. So it's very, you know, you would think, and I think the, um, the reality bears this out, that folks who are traveling to any of the storefronts south of Broadway are pretty much probably driving there, uh, going to whatever shops or stores they're interested in as far as their destination, and then driving somewhere else. It is not a walking experience. And uh, that block to the north provides the most opportunity for a walking experience. Uh, but it has a lot of missing teeth uh, that is important to address as we go forward. So that's the main piece of this particular diagram, and I think it is really telling about where the opportunities lie. So uh, this one really is just a, an inventory of buildings, and, and we have it and want to make sure that you have it in front of you as well, but there's nothing for me to review necessarily. So this, these, this next set of slides I think is really interesting. So you can see the, the diagram in the map, the, the um, study area itself is kind of the blue arrow that you see. The five minute uh, zone around downtown is uh, in red, the 10 minute zone is in green, and the 20 minute zone is uh, in blue. And these are drive times, not walk times. So you're gonna see how we uh, look at that kind of throughout. So if you look at spending by people living within the study area, retail spending uh, and then food and drink spending is on the right. Uh, you can see the, the amounts of spending uh, that happens from those folks within those districts. That doesn't mean spending downtown. You'll see that in a minute, but that is spending overall. When you look at the, you know, the overall uh, numbers of spending within the drive area, the actual amount of study area sales is that 28 million in retail and 2.9 million or 3 million in food and drink. So as a percentage, you can see kind of the relationship between the two. The next one uh, looks at study area sales, again, uh, for retail and food and drink. And the amount of retail that happens within the downtown district is a whole lot more than can be supported by certainly the study area. You can see that percentage is 800 and some percent. So there are a lot of folks coming into downtown, many folks coming into downtown um, to shop as well as to eat and drink uh, beyond those who live in the study area. Oops, didn't mean to do that. If you look at the percentage within a five minute uh, drive, that percentage uh, drops substantially. So that means folks who live within a five minute area are getting three fourths or so of their retail and food um, shopping done elsewhere than downtown. Uh, folks who live within the 10 minute area are getting 94 or 5% of what they need outside of downtown. And folks who are within a 20 minute uh, circumference or area are getting 99% of what they need aside from downtown. So you can say, you can look at this and say, wow, that's a bummer, I wish it were more. Or you can look at it as a lot of green grass. We have a lot of opportunity to um, move the needle just a little bit and have a really substantial impact. And this gets to the experiential quality of what people um, are wanting out of a shopping experience or a dining experience and whether or not they're getting it uh, in downtown Forest Lake. So uh, we look at, at this and say, you have got a lot of opportunity to make some strategic uh, targeted investments 
that are going to have some major impact on how people perceive and use your downtown district. So uh, I think I covered all of these points, but uh, the study area restaurants capture about 14% of the restaurant spending within a five minute drive time and 3% of the restaurant spending within a 10 minute drive time. So again, it just speaks to how much opportunity there is to make some impact. And finally, the last layer is this downtown activation. And uh, the two points that we want to make there are that regular happenings attract people. You know that. Um, and you do a lot with downtown events and activities, and it's really great. Um, and also parking should be convenient and easy. Um, and we see parking as an activation issue because uh, the experience of people going from their cars to the shop or store or restaurant that they're headed to um, is a, a point of activation in and of itself. And uh, activation will be enhanced by either wayfinding or really strategically locating parking within the downtown district. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll cover that necessarily, but the things that you've got are, you've got the 4th of July, you've got the Flake Festival, Hometown Holiday, Arts in the Park, You've got a lot of things going on from an event standpoint. Um, we wonder whether there are activities that could relocate to downtown. Maybe they're happening elsewhere in the community. Would they find downtown as a possibility for events? And then also, what are the, the everyday activities and occurrences and small scale events that are happening to draw folks all season long, all year round? Um, and that becomes a really important component, both seasonality and four season activities, as well as small things that are happening on a really regular basis, aside from the larger events. So we'll be looking at that a lot. Um, parking should be convenient and easy. We know that parking is going to be a really critical aspect of the strategies and ideas that we generate as part of this effort. Um, parking is probably your most strategic decision. Um, and too much parking is a buzzkill. Um, too little is a hassle. And wrongly lo locating it is just kind of a waste of resources. So we see it as a really important aspect of helping you think about this topic um, and discuss this topic and bring up ideas and thoughts as we go through the, through the effort. So a few points on parking. Existing parking for uses along 61 is primarily oriented to the rear of those properties. Um, parking lots between the 61 buildings and the lake have a tendency to affect the user experience, probably both for the folks in the building as well as those at Memorial Park. So that parking as strategically located as it is and important uh, as it is, it can also have negative aspects uh, to it. And we need to think about that, how we're mitigating some of those uh, issues. We know that boat and trailer parking uh, is a challenge downtown and something that we need to address. And Highway 61 uh, creates a barrier, um, making it really challenging to use west side parking lots. So that gets back to issues of street crossing, lighting, um, security, and perceptions of safety that people have in the downtown area. Um, and then seasonal use. Seasonal use, whether it's, again, boating and, and trailer parking uh, or the events and all the folks who are enjoying the lake. So that is the range of slides that I've got. Um, I'd really love to open it up to discussion questions among all of you. Um, we know that we're going to go back to most of these slides and make changes or updates and tweaks and have them ready to load up to the website um, in a week or so based on your comments as well as based on just kind of continual refinement of these. Um, so any thoughts that any of you have, um, we'd love to hear it. And I'll turn it back to you, Mayor. Thank you, Bruce. Um, members, let's just open it up. Questions at this point, just items of discussion. I just have, this is just a clarification. When you talk about the essentials needed for the bike path, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Um, bike parking, 
routes that are designated off the trail into downtown, clear gateways at the trail edge signifying downtown this way. Okay. Um, so wayfinding becomes a really important aspect of that. Um, services for bikes like water, uh, maybe a bike repair station, um, things like that. So all of those become aspects, either a public space or a, a private operation within the community or within the downtown district that um, both sends a signal as well as in reality supports bike use in the downtown core. We know, for instance, that folks who have really high end bikes, they do not want to leave their bike locked up somewhere where they can't see it. So how is um, bike parking being handled throughout the downtown area if they're coming in for food or drink? Is there convenient um, and visual bike parking adjacent to destinations that they would have? I had a similar question on, um, you mentioned the walk score was 17. Can you go back to that slide? Yep, absolutely. Um, one of my, so one of my questions was, is that just for the downtown core or is that Forest Lake overall? That's just the downtown core. And what does that 17 mean? And maybe the slide had some context there. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, oh, excuse me. I think that is the city as a whole. I apologize. I think that's the community as a whole. Is there an ability to get that score? I'm going to, I'll downtown? try. Okay. Yeah. And what does 17 mean? Is it means that it's a good, car dependent. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. a car dependent community. And um, what factor is part of the future analysis on specific factors or mm -hmm. opportunities we could, investments we could make to increase? I'd be interested in to know mm -hmm. those kind of key yep. factors. and. So it has to do with proximity and infrastructure primarily. So in other words, what um, within, I'll, and I'll go back to the neighborhoods surrounding yeah, downtown yeah. because they're the, they're the folks who have the opportunity to have a 10 minute walk from their home to the downtown. Um, do they have the infrastructure in place to be able to walk? Uh, because they have the proximity, we know that. So for them, it's a proximity issue, excuse me. Um, for folks who are a little bit farther out, um, it's both. It's it's you know proximity and and um, infrastructure. So it's where um, housing within the downtown core obviously is the the easiest way to create both, right. um, because you've got folks that are obviously are right there, and within your downtown core you have pretty good walking infrastructure. It's pretty good. There are some gaps, but it's pretty good. Cool. Thank you. Right, go ahead. So I, I, I obviously tend to agree with you on the, the bike thing. I know that's a big trend, but I'm surprised that nothing to this to the to yet has been talked about the marina and what the lake and generation mm -hmm. dollars that are being brought in that can be brought in with additional marina space, uh, trailer parking, and that. So when will that be talked about? And um, I'm just a little bit surprised it hasn't been talked to at this point. Oh, I think when, that's when great. We're bringing biking into it. Uh, I think that. The dollars that gen can be generated by marina and, and boating and that probably are equal if not much higher than, than the bike so let's talk about it now um, and really kick off that discussion and we'll uh, do some background analysis on it as well so obviously um, marina use and i mean it brings in a whole host of economic activity um, and the 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 negative aspect of that, I suppose, if there is one, is the the pressure that it puts on downtown parking, uh, especially more boat trailer parking. Well, so, then, so to interrupt you, yeah. uh, just layer into that the consideration of the resident. I mean, Forest Lake is a residential lake, and so the mm -hmm. there is a contingent of um, there's a population that can be served without car access uh, with, right. but needing adequate. So just wanted to layer in that Transient residential Transient docks aspect. and Correct. that kind of thing. Correct. Yeah. Okay. We will dig into that and be ready to present it at the next meeting. Thanks for mentioning that. Then I, and just as long as I, I have this. Um, one other thing, I, I also agree the, um, the tree canopy, very important. It's key. It makes people more comfortable when they're out and about. Mm -hmm. um, and for when we redid the street, the Broadway in 61, uh, 10, 12 years ago, whatever it is, they, they did a nice job of bringing that in. But 
I think that um, the city is doing a poor job of maintaining that or the county. There are even some of these slide pictures, you can see some trees that are just struggling mm -hmm. uh, greatly. And, and I think that we need to, as a city to focus on that and, and, and see how we need to better maintain that, the ones that we have and then in, and increase canopy. There's some really great new technologies and strategies for getting trees in urban environments to be robust. And so we'll be introducing those as part of the process too. Perfect. Susan, go ahead. Two things. Um, one, you said that you've started community engagement and I'm kind of tapped in and I'm looking for things like this, but I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. So I'm wondering what your strategies are for, for doing community engagement and getting answers to your questionnaire and things like that. Um, and then Hugo is, is just exploding with residential uh, and we've got this great bike trail and more and more families are wanting to do a relatively short bike, even though you can go from Minnetonka to Taylor's Falls along our trail. Um, there is a huge economic mm -hmm. potential there for us to be able to capture some of those folks evenings and weekends. And I guess one of one of my as I observe people, the, the folks that are using the lake and the marinas that are coming in from other places that are on the lake they're bringing their coolers and they're bringing their stuff and they're bringing their tackle and they're, you know, they're, they're pretty self-contained. Mm -hmm. Do you, what are the things that we could maybe do to say, you don't have to do that. You can get everything you want for your boat day here instead. Mm -hmm. Only bike day. Is yeah. that what you mean? But what you, actually boat or building bike? On, on Blake's opportunities to, to have economic drivers that use that, that those folks that are using boats, but those are sort of the same thing that the people on bikes are not gonna be bringing their whole cooler. Mm -hmm. So how can we develop things that will encourage people to either have their, when they're taking their bike trip to stop off mm -hmm. and, and use things and then not say, yeah, well, I have to bring all my stuff with me mm -hmm. for my day on the lake. Well, I think, um, anytime there's a, a new industry or a new act activity coming into a district, it's a little bit of a ramp up period. So the community in public realm or in public spaces can do things like bike repair stations, bike lockers, um, bike racks, provide water for bikers, you know, little things that are going to allow them to comfortably get off the trail and come into the community. That will in turn, uh, create potentially a market that others entrepreneurs are going to see and um, think about maybe Forest Lake is a great spot for me to open a bike shop, to open an outfitter, to rent bikes, to do other things. And I think what, what we would want to try and accomplish with this effort is to lay the groundwork for how that evolutionary process begins. Uh, in the case of bikes, as an example. Uh, boating, you have a strong history in it, and maybe it's a matter of focusing in more on the connectivity, you know, this notion of transient slips and getting people who are coming from the residential surroundings into the downtown, um, make it more convenient, make it operate better within the business district as far as trailer parking. Some of those kinds of strategies maybe is our best our best approach to that. Rita, I'm going to ask you if you would come up and talk a in a little more detail about the community engagement aspects. Thank you. I'll just have a okay. Yep. Um, so, thank you, because I was hoping you were going to give me a chance. <laughs> so, to your point on community engagement, um, we have just put up on, um, I believe it's the EDA site, technically. Uh, the link to get to the information about the downtown plan on the interactive website. It's only been up for less than a week. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can take a look at it. We'll make sure that we get the information out. Um, Dan is gonna be working on putting a link from the city's main page to that website. And then we're gonna start doing the community engagement that you would see out in the community. We wanted to get the electronic one up first 
for a few reasons. One is it's there. So if we're out in the community and they see us and they talk to us and they want to go home and look at more things online, then they have it and there'll be some energy already on the website before we do the in-person. I also wanted to wait because we're all just transitioning uh, for the in-person engagement, Art in the Park, and get that to be a little more established before we start showing up and trying to encourage things and have people be out. So the plan is to do that in July and maybe in August. So that, again, it's kind of the strategy of building upon each other. And Dan just brought up the link. Um, so that's the uh, EDA website. You can see there's a word wall and an interactive map. Um, and that's what those two look like. And you can, uh, the word wall is just tell us a word that you would use to describe downtown. It's really quick, it's really easy, but it's a way of doing something uh, easy for folks. And then the map, which is the lower one, um, there's four different icons and you bring them down and you can provide a comment about those topics. Uh, we use this extensively, people like it. Uh, we, I would love it if you would go out and start adding dots because it's just like everything, we just need people to add some comments and then it'll start happening. But nobody really wants to be the first one. Even though your name and your email doesn't show up, everybody's always a little nervous. So if you can go out and take a look and add some, that'll help generate other folks um, to participate. And then, as I said, we'll start going out and doing the more out um, in-person engagement, but I want this established before we do that because the hope would be you walk away with a little business card that says, go to this website, add more thoughts because when you're doing those events, people won't have enough time to really engage with you. Yeah, exactly. So this will be, that's why it's kind of a tandem approach to doing it. And then if you have ideas of more events or you have more things that you think we could do, we're certainly open um, and interested in, in hearing what those might be. Um, flyers in the businesses downtown could work. Um, we can do the cards when we do stakeholder interviews that they, you know, that the people that you're meeting with. I mean, there's different ways of doing it, but it does take also your help in kind of getting the word out to folks that you know. Um, hopefully we're making it easy enough that, uh, and everybody's kind of moved virtually over the last year, so it shouldn't be so intimidating as it used to be. So does that work? Any other ideas? That helps. Awesome. Great. I'll stay here till, go ahead, Finn. <laughs> go ahead, Finn. Can we go back to the map of your downtown contained area? <clears throat> which, which one, Mark? Oh, almost any of them would work for me, just as long as you almost show the constraints. Okay. That, that's just fine. Okay. Um, I always find we've limited you greatly in the context of the area that you're working with. And I always have this urge to push just beyond the bounds mm -hmm. of what's going on here. Uh, there are prop properties or non-use areas just beyond some of these limits that will probably be a big piece of consideration for how you move in and transition to this territory. I know you're thinking beyond those limits, but mm -hmm. it might all actually help to take the diagramming a little bit further away and let it mm. bleed away into the distance. We'll do it. The uh, very north end of town, do you find any oddity up there in, in terms of how we've kind of called that limit? The, the territory just south of Matson's funeral home has a lot of the same characteristics of the, of the territory that's just north of Matson's funeral homes and those condominiumized pieces there. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little notch that came out of there too that's probably a rental piece of property and will transition. So I'm just wondering if, because the world is so much the same north of Matson's as it is south, um, maybe it should be a piece of the thinking because whatever you think can happen south could potentially happen north in the 10 to 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. thought pattern. Well, we certainly will, will kind of bleed this edge out so that it's easier to see areas that are closer to the boundary and then uh, conduct, you know, some of our analysis on those areas beyond the boundary as well. Okay, because I do think that north edge probably the line could be cut differently than it is okay. more cleanly than just that little notch that comes out. Got it. Okay. Questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. A common I like to appreciate the more the like of views of us certain things. Because people mm -hmm. bring in the big codes, they take up all the parking, it's all in bold, the fire when they come back in, and then they go home. Mm -hmm. We had two weekends where we had zero people in the restaurant because Okay. So I just want to speculation on, on the, um, I mean, this just might be a personal drive because there's a lot of, I don't know. I presume that the boat club is bringing in enough strength so that it wants to grow 
that's something that's showing up to people. Um, and I don't know personally whether the uh, boat parking and the access to the lake, uh, if could be solved another way, might be a more enhanced territory for either moving the boat club down toward where the boat landing is, gaining more of a green sense, green to, to blue water sense of what's there instead of the marina, and would also challenge that parking to maybe free up a little bit if in fact the landing and all the people in and out on their boat and trailers is a greater benefit than maybe getting that stuff back mm -hmm. for parking and or park or relaxation there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was always, I don't know how you actually determine that other than DNR saying we're good with what we've got elsewhere. We don't need this one. And then the business is saying, we're not really getting that much of an attribute out of the in and off the lake. People coming in. That yeah. we really could maybe keep that as winter access to the lake, but maybe we could just relax that territory. I know it would have helped hmm. development along in over the years if they thought that hadn't been there and they could have utilized that parking more efficiently for hmm. the businesses or the residents that might have come. Got it. Great. I'll just mention also, Reed is taking good notes, by the way. So we're getting, we're capturing all of your comments. Mara, if you don't mind, uh, my, my concern or at least a question. I, first of all, I've always agreed with the bicycle concept. We've talked about that many, many times here at the council and, and beyond. Uh, well, let's not forget about winter mm -hmm. and, and we make sure that we integrate uh, these activities that can be kind of meshed together at one time or another for parking or and are we going to be snowmobile friendly that kind of thing mm -hmm. and i think that would help uh the businesses uh particular restaurant or or uh, bar or whatever that kind of thing too so yeah just so we don't forget about that concept the other four months of the year you know mm -hmm. so let's i really like that comment about snowmobiles um to me it's really similar to the boating issue we yeah. should be looking at that so sure. we will Stanley, there are times at the log cabin when there's no more snowmobiles parked there than there are cars. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I want to make sure that that happens. Maybe we can make that work for our downtown too. You know, there's got to be a way of, you know, that not all of them are rebels. You know, I mean, they're, they're just people out for a ride. And if we can make that more friendly and, and uh, we'd help our downtown businesses, I think. Great. Okay. That's my Jerry, thought. go ahead. So I have uh, three uh, questions and maybe comments. So first of all, if I can just address the snowmobile thing for a second, because I am an avid snowmobiler and part of the Forest Lake Snowmobile Club. Forest Lake is not considered a friendly snowmobile destination. Interesting. So, and that has been going on for years. So if we want Forest Lake to be a snowmobile friendly destination, we have to, we have to find some ways for access on and off the lake to Hardwood Creek and then from Hardwood Creek to the businesses. That's why it's not a, a snowmobile friendly place because people can't go any place. Same issue for, as for the bicycles. Same right? issues yeah. with the bicycles, yeah. right. And snowmobile it, is a little more complicated because of conditions and stuff like that, but it is definitely something that needs to be considered. Secondly, I thought, um, you know, there are certain things we as a city can control relative to the redevelopment. Uh, one of my questions for you in your planning process are you in intending to have any discussions with Washington County regarding their plan for Hardwood Creek? Um, well, we certainly can. I, I did not know that Washington County had necessarily additional plans. So I don't know that, but they are, but they are, the, they are the owner and they're the ones that redeveloped mm -hmm. Hardwood Creek here a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. I was involved with them on some things relative to accesses off of Hardwood Creek for people to get off signage and so forth like that. I just think it'd be, it'd be positive for us to know what their thoughts are on a 10, 15 year plan for Hardwood Creek for us going down one path and they have a completely different idea over here. We will do that. And then the other part of that would be a lot of discussion about US 61 and access across 61, you know, to get to the east side of 61. Again, do you normally have any discussion with MnDOT planners? Mm -hmm. MnDOT is on our list. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then thirdly, um, or fourthly, I guess, um, relative to the amount of boat traffic and the issues of boating on Forest Lake, um, because of the pandemic, it actually has, has caused uh, almost a 30% increase in the amount of boat traffic on Forest Lake. And, you know, we were a lake that people didn't come up to 
before the pandemic because it was like, oh, it's too far away. Plus a lot of people don't have boats. Forest Lake has become a destination for boaters. There are a lot of people now that have found Forest Lake to be a great lake to come up for the day to go boating. And so I don't ever expect that significant increase of, of transient boaters to change in years to come because they have found out that Forest Lake is a great lake to come to. And so something we have to think about in our 10, 15, 20 year planning. We were this quiet little lake that people didn't come to, now they are coming. Are there boat clubs operating on Forest Lake? Yes. It's your boat okay. club is the only, only one there and there's another mm -hmm. called Tim's Marina down on Highway 97 down there, but um, that's the only two. Okay. Yeah. All right. And they have made requests for expansion, the boat club. They have, yes. okay. And they operate right at the dock, right at Lakeside mm -hmm. Memorial. Other questions, Ryan, go ahead. I'll just make myself available when you guys have time through the plan to talk about future co-op agreement projects that are happening within the city, with the county and states that are bringing significant amount of pedestrian improvements with them. So uh, in 2024, we have one with Washington County. That's a north-south route that's far, far away from here, but it is gonna provide uh, off-street trail. And then 2024, MnDOT's working on Highway 97 to provide a 10 foot trail on the south side of that that would connect out to the Divergent Diamond and then into the Hard Creek Trail too. And then 2026, where there'll be some nice connection opportunities uh, with the road just right here, County State at Highway 32 and a potential trailhead area, you know, right there with the Hard Creek Trail too. So that would be reconstructing that. So those are three local projects that are coming with significant amount of improvements plus pedestrian improvements. But the big one that's still chasing some money and the final scope of the projects is not quite unknown as the Highway 8. But if they get everything fully funded that they're wanting to build and envisioning, that would extend the Swedish Immigrant, Swedish immigrant Trail all the way down and connect to the Hard Creek Trail. Yes. Now all of a sudden you got bikers such as Dan that could bike all the way to work on <laughs> regional trail opportunities. And speaking with Washington County, we're, all, we're trying to change some trail designations with them on regional trails so we can chase separate funding opportunities because right now their regional farthest regional trail and their their uh, comprehensive plan is farther south where we'd want it uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere between hugo and forest lake and we're like mm -hmm. can we move it up or make another tier ring so we can chase some of that opportunity to help bring in more networking into the community right. but anytime you guys need to go over some of those potential projects we can provide you with some information on that too great awesome. okay and I did look up the snowmobile stuff because I know that was a big question with the Divergent Diamond Project is a lot of snowmobiles used to cross that old highway bridge that had some sort of a shoulder. And I know a lot of snowmobiles builders use that Polaris ride command app and there's not even a route within Force Lake now. It just shows you jetting into Third Lake on the east side, but everywhere around. So obviously, you know, if you're a guy that's not familiar with this area and you follow that ride command app, that's I think do you use it? Do you use that snowmobile app? Yeah, most last time we were using it. And, and it doesn't even show you coming to Forest Lake. That's why it's considered Forest Lake is considered uh, a unfriendly right. snowmobile yeah. Interesting. We gotta fix so it. So it also has ATV mapping on that. So it's free. You could download it and just look at that to see what's in the area. Great. So nice. Yeah, they pack up by the end of my driveway. <laughs> the Divergent diamond that Ryan's referring to is the new bridge that's at 97. Okay. 35. So, um, other other questions. It did you had a one of the slides you had was it showed the mix between food and beverage and retail. Mm -hmm. And I have it in my head that one feeds the other. So if someone comes for food and beverage and maybe stays for retail and vice versa, is that the mix that we have today? Is that desirable mix between food and beverage and retail, or are there benchmarks that we would look to move the needle? And maybe that's not a question for today, but that was just something I okay. saw and struck. I'd be interested in knowing, is that an optimal mix or mm -hmm. do we have not enough retail to support future food and beverage or just be interested in what, it, what does that look like? And then what that helps to kind of designate mm -hmm. you know, land use and what part of that might need some pro promoting versus what's just naturally. Occurring. We'll come back with a look at that question. Good, thank you. Other questions for today? 
a um, quick comment about the um, just the website that I noticed. Um, I love that it's on the Invest in Forest Lake site. Let's just make sure that it's easily accessible from a cityofforestlake.com um, and splashed all over. Because I think it's also, you know, there's a there's an EDA page on the cityofforestlake.com and then there's the <coughs> forestlake.com front page. As we're ready, and it sounds like we're at the spot where we're ready for people to actually be accessing that, let's make sure that that's a quick link. Um, I love that we've got the Invest in Forest Lake site for external, you know, purpose people looking to invest, but I'm not sure that it's the go-to for residents. And can that get connected to the chamber, or is it already? Yes, yes. When we're when we're ready, let's just make that a standard feature for weekly newsletter and all of the typical communication channels. And it sounds like now we have, no, we're at that spot where. We're ready to start getting that published as and as we can link that to the chamber and certainly other source pages as well. Fabulous. Any particular next steps we want to outline before we adjourn for the evening? Oh, Susan. Just one last question. How much value with other communities have you found um, for for cities that are trying to get more more folks coming to their city? for the um, the statewide um, that gives the, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it. It's, it. I get an email that says, um, here's what's happening in Lanesboro, or here's, here's a, a neat place to go in um, Lindstrom or other communities that are part of the tourism Minnesota. Mm -hmm. That's what I want, tourism Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is is that a value to communities? Because I know that we're not eligible to be part of that at this time. Well, I think it's really valuable to communities who have assets and experiences that are kind of statewide of statewide significance. So Lanesboro has the Root River Trail, um, you know, because that is what it is, along with the Arts District in, in Lanesboro. You know, they've established that. Um, there's ramp up time. There's there's evolutionary time. I think involved in in getting uh, to that point. So next steps for us. We are uh, beginning now the process of looking at uh, trends, as I mentioned, both regional and national trends that would affect the way we think about downtown Forest Lake. We will also be refining and incorporating your ideas into the analysis work. And um, as soon as we get that uh, analysis piece to a point where we feel like it's ready for prime time, we're going to go ahead and load that to the website so anyone can access that. And then we'd like to come back and present again to you at the end of July, I think the 24th. Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah, whatever the date is. That is our next scheduled, yeah. our next scheduled meeting. We'll have it here in just a second. Yeah, July, uh, just July 26th. Great. Be our next scheduled workshop day. And we'll be doing a, a lot of um, stakeholder interviews and work with uh, other agencies and local stakeholders um, around that, as well as uh, beginning our engagement with, with community events. So we'll, you'll see us at some events. Fantastic. Members of the EDA downtown committee, anything further this evening or other questions? I've just got a comment. Um, when you talk about stakeholders, <clears throat> I had mentioned before looking at bringing potential stakeholders in to look at us, not the mm -hmm. people currently here. Mm -hmm. Did you see the big sign in Hugo that Hugo, find you guys, <laughs> driving through Hugo, going north, great big huge sign where that restaurant burned down said that Hugo is uh, revitalizing their town. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested, you know, contact them. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should be looking at going outside and talking about, okay, what do you want in our downtown? Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm specifically looking for anything to do with the arts, gallery space, uh, studio space, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And looking to people in Stillwater that maybe can't afford the rents in Stillwater, what we could offer them if they came here. When you're we, talking about the condo. Yep, yeah, we do have that programmed in, in the next stage of our project of the, the downtown study. Um, for now, stakeholders represents a lot of communication with downtown businesses, uh, folks who are either living, operating, uh, 
things within uh, the downtown area. So it, it is looking at the core, but I like the idea of going out also. Uh, so let's, we'll find a way to make that happen earlier in the process than we otherwise would. Absolutely. Along those lines, um, some sort of when we're ready for whenever the right time is some sort of press release and now, you know, or some sort of a, a, an article um, to just talk about the plan and to invite further comment, I think might also fit well. Um, and we've and written that press release. It's in fabulous. the hands of city fabulous. staff. Good. Yep. All right. That um, I, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. And, and and that is at what point are we starting to talk to businesses and uh, how can I help uh, facilitate that process? Great. Beginning right after the Fourth of July. Perfect. Yeah. I like that answer. Do you have contact information that I could get from you? All right. Good deal. All right. Well, that is a good segue to wish everyone a fantastic fourth, fantastic and safe Fourth of July. And we are adjourned. We'll see everyone for EDA next meeting.